the digital models we got now are already very close to as good as brains and will get to be much better than brains. Jeffrey Hinton, godfather of artificial intelligence, recently gave a lecture at Oxford University. And in this video, I'm going to break down everything important that he mentioned, starting from how existing large language models are already going to go to artificial general intelligence level, how low powered analog computers are actually going to get better and more efficient, bringing the cost of operations of these models down and why existing large language models are posing existential risks to us humans. Let's dive in. So if you don't know who Professor Jeffrey Hinton is, this is the guy who is considered godfather of artificial intelligence, along with Jan LeCun. These guys have published a lot of amazing research paper together. Now Jan LeCun, he is now Jan LeCun is spearheading projects of artificial intelligence at Meta, and then Jeffrey Hinton used to be working at Google. Now he has left it actually. So he gave this 36-minute video, and I have cut down this video in a amazing 10-minute clip. So enjoy. And I also thought that making AI models more like the brain would make them better. I thought the brain was a whole lot better than the AI we had. And if we could make AI a bit more like the brain, for example, by having three time scales, most of the models we have at present have just two time scales, one for the changing of the weights, which is slow, and one for the words coming in, which is fast, changing the neural activities. So the changes in neural activities and changes in weights. The brain has more time scales than that. The brain has rapid changes in weights that quickly decay away. And that's probably how it does a lot of short-term memory. And we don't have that in our models for technical reasons to do with being able to do matrix matrix multiplies. Um, I still believe that if once we got that into our models, they'll get better. But because of what I was doing for the two years previous to that, I suddenly came to believe that maybe the things we've got now, the digital models we've got now, are already very close to as good as brains and will get to be much better than brains. A large language model has, say, a trillion weights. You have 100 trillion weights. Even if you only use 10% of them for knowledge, that's 10 trillion weights. But the large language model, in its trillion weights, knows thousands of times more than you do. So it's got much, much more knowledge. And that's partly because it's seen much, much more data. But it might be because it has a much better learning algorithm. We're not optimized for that. We're not optimized for packing lots of experience into a few connections, where well, a trillion is a few now. Um, we're optimized for having not many experiences. You only live for about a billion seconds. That's assuming you don't learn anything after you're 30, which is pretty much true. So you, you live for about a billion seconds and you've got a hundred trillion connections. So you've got crazily more parameters than you have experiences. So our brain's optimized for making the best use of not very many experiences. Another big problem with mortal computation is that if the software is inseparable from the hardware, once a system has learned, if the hardware dies, you lose all the knowledge. It's mortal in that sense. And so how do you get that knowledge into another mortal system? Well, you get the old one to give a lecture and the new ones to figure out how to change the weights in their brain so they would have said that. That's called distillation. You try and get a student model to mimic the output of a teacher model. And that works, but it's not that efficient. Um, some of you may have noticed that universities just aren't that efficient. It's very hard to get the knowledge from the professor into the student. So this distillation method, a sentence, for example, has a few hundred bits of information. And even if you learned optimally, you couldn't convey more than a few hundred bits. But if you take these big digital models, then if you look at a bunch of agents, that all have exactly the same neural netting with exactly the same weights. And they're digital, so they run in exact, they use those weights in exactly the same way. And these thousand different agents all go off and look at different bits of the internet and learn stuff. And now you want each of them to know what the other ones learned. You can achieve that by averaging the gradients or averaging the weights. So you can get massive communication of what one agent learned to all the other agents. So when you share the weights or you share the gradients, you're communicating a trillion numbers, not just a few hundred bits, but a trillion real numbers. And so they're fantastically much better at communicating. And that's what they have over us. They're just much, much better at communicating between multiple copies of the same model. And that's why GPT-4 knows so much more than a human. It wasn't one model that did it. It was a whole bunch of copies of the same model running on different hardware. So my conclusion which I don't really like, um, is that digital computation 
requires a lot of energy. And so it would never evolve. We had to evolve making use of the quirks of the hardware to be very low energy. But once you've got it, it's very easy for agents to share. And GPT-4 has thousands of times more knowledge in about 2% of the weights. So that's quite depressing. Um, biological computation is great for evolving because it requires very little energy. Um, but my conclusion is that digital computation is just better. Um, and so I think it's fairly clear that maybe in the next 20 years, I'd say with a probability of about 0.5 in the next 20 years, it'll get smarter than us. And very probably in the next 100 years, it'll be much smarter than us. The thing that probably worries me most is that if you want an intelligent agent that can get stuff done, you need to give it the ability to create sub goals. So if you want to go to the States, you have a sub goal of getting to the airport. And you can focus on that sub goal and not worry about everything else for a while. So super intelligences will be much more effective if they're allowed to create sub goals. And once they are allowed to do that, they'll very quickly realize there's an almost universal sub goal which helps with almost everything, which is get more control. So I talked to a vice president of the European Union about whether these things, these things we want to get control so that they could do things better, the things we wanted so they could do it better. Her reaction was, well, why wouldn't they? We've made such a mess of it. So she took that for granted. Um, so they're going to have the sub goal of getting more power. So they're more effective at achieving things that are beneficial for us. Um, and they'll find it easy to get more power because they'll be able to manipulate people. So Trump, for example, could invade the capital without ever going there himself. Just by talking, he could invade the capital. And these super intelligences, as long as they can talk to people, when they're much smarter than us, they'll be able to persuade us to do all sorts of things. And so I don't think there's any hope of a big switch that turns them off. Whoever is going to turn that switch off will be convinced by the super intelligence. That's a very bad idea. Then another thing that worries um, many people is what happens if super intelligences compete with each other? you'll have evolution. The one that can grab the most resources will become the smartest. Um, as soon as they get any sense of self-preservation, then you'll get evolution occurring. The ones with more sense of self-preservation will win, and the more aggressive ones will win. And then you'll get all the problems that jumped up chimpanzees like us have, which is we evolved in small tribes and there's lots of aggression and competition with other tribes. And I want to finish by talking a bit about um, an epiphany I had at the beginning of 2023. I had always thought that we were a long, long way away from superintelligence. I used to tell people 50 to 100 years, maybe 30 to 100 years. It's a long way away. We don't need to worry about it now. So digital computation is great. Um, you can run the same program on different computers, different pieces of hardware, or the same neural net on different pieces of hardware. All you have to do is save the weights. And that means it's immortal. Once you've got some weights, they're immortal, because if the hardware dies, as long as you've got the weights, you can make more hardware and run, run the same neural net. But to do that, we run transistors at very high power, so they behave digitally. And we have to have hardware that does exactly what you tell it to. That was great when we instructed computers by telling them exactly how to do things. But we've now got another way of making computers do things. And so now we have the possibility of using all the very rich analog properties of hardware to get computations done at far lower energy. So these big language models, when they're training, learn like megawatts, use like megawatts, and we use 30 watts. So because we know how to train things, Maybe we could use analog hardware, and every piece of hardware is a bit different, but we train it to make use of its peculiar properties so that it does what we want, so it gets the right output for the input. And if we do that, then we can abandon the idea that hardware and software have to be separate. Um, we can have weights that only work in that bit of hardware, and then we can be much more energy efficient. So I started thinking about more, what I call mortal computation, where you've abandoned that distinction between hardware and software. You're using very low power analog computation. You can parallelize over trillions of weights that are stored as conductances. Um, and what's more, the hardware doesn't need to be nearly so reliable. You don't need to have hardware that at the level of the instructions will always do what you tell it to. 
you can have goopy hardware that you grow, and then you just learn to make it do the right thing. So you should be able to use hardware much more cheaply. Maybe even um, do some genetic engineering on neurons to make it out of recycled neurons. I want to give you one example of how this is much more efficient. So the thing you're doing in neural networks all the time is taking a vector of neural activities and multiplying it by a matrix of weights to get the vector of neural activities in the next layer, at least get the inputs to the next layer. And so a vector matrix multiplies the thing you need to make efficient. So the way we do it in a digital computer is we have these transistors that are driven at very high power to represent bits in, say, a 32-bit number. And then to multiply two 32-bit numbers, you need to perform, I never did any computer science courses, but I think you need to perform about a thousand one-bit digital operations. It's about the square of the bit length, um, if you want to do it fast. Um, so you do lots of these digital operations. There's a much simpler way to do it, which is you make a neural activity be a voltage, you make a weight be a conductance, and a voltage times the conductance is a charge per unit time, and charges just add themselves up. So you can do your vector matrix multiply just by putting some voltages through some conductances, and what comes into each neuron in the next layer will be the product of this vector with those weights. Um, that's great. It's hugely more energy efficient. You can buy chips that do that already. So if you like the video, consider subscribing. See you in the next one.